Okay, let's start with, or I shouldn't say start, but let's pick up where we left off. So, three, activation of the PC2s and the roles of 7B2. So the PC2s, remember, these are the uh, pro, what is it, pro-hormone convertases? Yeah, pro-hormone convertases. So this is the one uh, with the two after it. Um, so PC2 is also synthesized as part of a precursor, but is processed with the TGN and ISG. Uh, there is a very distinct mechanism for activation of PC2, which takes one to two hours and provides the delay necessary for the correct stages of processing. So after this gets synthesized, it takes one to two hours for it to become activated or put into its active form on average. So uh, PC2 has a specific binding protein, 7B2, which is required for transport, folding, and activation of PC2. The N terminal of 7B2 has a chaperone function, while the C terminal of 7B2 inhibits the PC2. So uh, this one protein, 7B2, um, not only helps the PC2 fold correctly, and that's what a chaperone does, but this happens at the beginning, the early part of the peptide, also known as the N terminal. And then at the C terminal, this has a, um, it has a way to inhibit PC2 from working. So 7B2 is thought to bind to the catalytic domain of PC2 and is required for the efficient transport and activation of the enzyme. So 7B2 and pro-PC2 form a complex in the endoplasmic reticulum, and this enables trafficking to the trans-Golgi network, where 7B2 is cleaved by furin. So 7B2, excuse me, has a polybasic furin cleavage site, which then gets cleaved by furin in the trans-Golgi uh, network. And um, I believe that's trans-Golgi network. One second, let me... Yeah, the yeah trans-Golgi network. So where 7B2 is cleaved by furin, the C-terminal of 7B2 then binds pro-PC2 and acts as an inhibitor. As the complex is trafficked into the immature secretory granules, the change in pH enables the autocatalytic process to activate PC2. So as the pH changes, and um, I would presume it's as the pH gets closer to neutral, because the trans-Golgi network and the endoplasmic reticulum, I believe, is a little acidic. As it becomes more neutralized, the, uh, this allows PC2 to cleave itself. And when it starts cleaving itself, then it becomes activated. So this, in turn, causes the cleavage of the C-terminal 7B2 peptide, which then releases PC2. Thus, the biosynthesis and activation of PC2 is tightly linked with that of 7B2. So 7B2, you can think of it as as a regulator. It is something that helps the formation of the entire uh, pro-hormone convertase 2, but it is also deactivated and removed by PC2 as well. And this happens when um, in small, I would presume in small amounts, this um, ends up cleaving itself. And then when those few start cleaving themselves, they end up cleaving the 7B2 quickly, and then they become active. And when they become active, they start, it, it would be similar to an exponential growth function, they start cleaving others of their kind, and by doing that, you can go from 0 to 100% very quickly. So when 7B2 is knocked out in mice, the activity of PC2 in the pars intermedia, which is of the pituitary, and remember this is in the middle of the pituitary, uh, this is prevented. Um, the mice fail to produce alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which remember this is one of the hormones that is on POMC, and instead have dramatically increased ACTH levels. So ACTH is not being cleaved into alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone and display a Cushing syndrome-like phenotype. And let's look up Cushing syndrome so that we're all familiar. Let's... Uh, Cushing syndrome. So this is an example of Cushing syndrome. is a collection of signs and symptoms due to prolonged exposure 
to glucocorticoids, such as cortisol. So I believe this might also be called a um, moon phase. Let me, yeah, so um, the inappropriate production of glucocorticoids uh, can cause uh, too much water retention and it can create a moon phase. So um, this is the person's facial appearance three months after treatment with inhaled uh, fluticasone. So fluticasone is a basically a steroid drug and it's supposed to function similarly to uh, glucosteroids, which is a subset of steroid hormones. And so um, this person was being treated with fluticasone for presumably some completely different uh, disease. And then as a side effect of that fluticasone treatment, um, it ended up causing moon phase. And so um, here it says it could be used for long-term management of asthma and COPD. So that is what Cushing syndrome is, or and this is Cushing syndrome-like phenotype with central obesity. So these mice with the 7B2 knocked out of it or removed from them, the 7B2 does not uh, exist and without 7B2, PC2 cannot fold and be uh, activated properly. And since PC2 can't be activated properly, then the POMC is the pro protein. Uh, I should it shouldn't wouldn't necessarily be POMC as a whole, but the peptides that are a part of POMC cannot be cleaved normally. So in the pituitary, there would normally be normally be some form of cleavage that takes place. But here, without the PC2, it's not happening. So we have a different ratio of peptides uh, than we would normally have. And this can cause Cushing syndrome-like phenotype. So uh, mortality from the excess ACTH can be rescued by adrenalectomy, so by removing the adrenal glands. So PC2 null mice uh, have higher ACTH in the pars intermedia of the pituitary than the 7B2 null mice. So if you completely remove PC2, you can have even more ACTH. Uh, so that would, and if you remove 7B2, um, then it would still secrete more. Wait. Wait, PC2 null mice have higher ACTH in the part. Oh, I, should, I shouldn't. Uh, so... If you completely get rid of pro-hormone convertase 2, it seems like there's even more ACTH that is being produced. However, um, with 7B2, if that is removed, then you might not be producing as much ACTH, but it's m being secreted much more easily, or I should say the ACTH is being secreted more easily. So going back, Let's look at, uh, so here is a human peptide cleavage site. So here we have ACTH, um, which is a part of the POMC. And so presumably uh, somewhere in this area is where the PC2 would normally cleave ACTH into alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone and the other the other things. So, um, and this would happen at this lysine, lysine, arginine, arginine area. So, just so you know, that is the, um, that's what it looks like. So, uh, here, the role of pro SAAS in inhibition of PC1 and 3. So, with the discovery of 7B2, there was a suggestion that endogenous inhibitors of PC13 might also exist. So this is that we usually very frequently in biochemistry and biology, uh, if there is a strategy that is being employed by an organism, we often assume that that same strategy um, is going to be employed elsewhere in biology. And sometimes that can be even within the same creature. So if there's a strategy that is used for one particular enzyme of a particular class, we can very easily assume that there is a possibility that that same strategy is being used in a different uh, enzyme or a different protein. So here, 7B2 was regulating PC2. So 
we were thinking, okay, PC13 might also have its own uh, regulatory or, or an inhi inhibitor that is necessary for its uh, production, uh, protection, and uh, secretion. So this led to the identification of PRO-SAAS, or PROSAS, as a potential inhibitor of PC13. So PROSAS is expressed primarily in the brain and in other neuroendocrine tissues. Its overexpression in ATT20 mouse pituitary corticotrope adenoma cells reduces POMC processing by inhibiting PC13, but PC2 is not affected. So this is, um, this would be something that ends up doing the opposite almost. So uh, process is inhibiting uh, PC13. Now, this isn't saying whether or not that it plays a role in the proper processing of PC13, but this is saying that if you have too much of process, it will attack or it will prevent PC13 from working correctly. And presumably, the, these mouse pituitary corticotrope adenoma cells, which is a cancer of the pituitary gland, Presumably, these cells started upregulating the production of process uh, because it was beneficial for their health. Granted, a lot of weird things happen in cancer, so you can't uh, guarantee that, but this is what we presume is happening. So, cellular sites of action of PC13 and PC2. So, the subsequent identification of other members of this family of convertases along with cellular localization studies, have, has revealed that the majority of these endoproteases cleave peptides in the transgolgi network or at the plasma membrane. So the transgolgi network, you can view that as a bunch of bubbles that are within the cell. And things get uh, moved from the endoplasmic reticulum, which surrounds the nucleus, things move from there out into the trans-Golgi network over time, and it's sort of like bubbles are budding off and moving into, uh, into other areas. So in this area, which can be a more regulated um, area, so remember the, the cell regulates everything in it, but if you have, it's, these are bubbles within the cell, and these are even more tightly regulated than the cell, cellular cytoplasm is. So in comparison, oh, and this is where, this location is where these endoproteases such as PC13 and PC2, this is where they are cleaving the peptides. This is where they are taking POMC and possibly a lot of other um, proteins and cleaving them into their bioactive forms. So and presumably this would also be how they can uh, collect the peptides and concentrate them into uh, vesicles. Uh, continuing, in comparison, PC13 and PC2 cleave the peptides in dense core secretory granules. Um, this is very relevant as their targets are primarily, primarily hormones and neuropeptides like POMC and the regulation of the release of the active peptides is critical for the function of these hormones. So, um, in compare. so I think here they're saying PC13 and PC2 is not cleaving in the trans-Golgi network. Uh, that is true, because these, themse these themselves are getting cle they're cleaving themselves in the trans-Golgi network. So these aren't cleaving in the trans-Golgi network. Rather, they are put into dense core secretory granules. So they're put into vesicles that contain a bunch of peptides or things that should be, uh, or things that will become peptides. And that is where they seem to um, enact their proteolytic cleavage. Uh, this is very relevant as their targets are primarily hormones and neuropeptides. 
So this is in contrast, uh, this is to contrast with a lot of other endoproteases that might just work in the trans-Golgi network. So, and the regulation of the release of the active peptides is critical for the function of these hormones. Although it has been suggested that PC13 does not have a transmembrane domain, the endogenous 84 and 66 kildalton forms of PC13 can associate with the secretory granule membranes in a lipid wrap. So a lipid wrap, remember your cellular membrane has a lipid bilayer. So uh, that means it's fatty. The inside of it is very fatty. So thing, proteins can anchor themselves to these membranes by forming lipid wraps, which would be when they have a part of their, of their peptide or a part of their uh, structure is very fatty. And this fatty portion can insert itself into the membrane. And when it inserts into the membrane, then a bunch of them can coagulate together into a uh, lipid wrap. So continuing with the end terminal portion of the luminal side and the regions 619 and 638, which are the amino acid, the number of the amino acids, uh, these are acting as a transmembrane domain. So these are the portions, this is the portion that ends up sticking into the cell membrane and the end terminal portion um, is within the uh, within the vesicle so luminal side would be uh, the portion within so uh, this leaves 115 amino acids from the C terminus of PC13 in the cytoplasm so this uh, the N terminal portion is stuck inside of the vesicle or stuck inside of the secretory granule and then 619 to 638 is within the membrane, and then the other 115 amino acid residues of the protein are sticking outside of the vesicle or outside of the secretory granule, and they are just floating, uh, floating around in the cytoplasm. So, uh, although the alpha helical domain and alpha helix is a secondary structure, so don't worry too much about that, at the C terminus may associate it with the cytoplasmic side of the secretory granule membrane. So they're saying there might, uh, there is a portion of these 115 amino acid residues that might curl back and interact with the membrane some way. So therefore the catalytic domain would be within the lumen of the secretory vesicle and cleavage of arginine to arginine adjacent to membrane to the membrane would produce the mature uh, PC13. So the catalytic domain is within the vesicle. It's within the secretory granule or the secretory granule. So uh, we would presume that as it, since it's stuck in there, uh, these arginines can get cleaved. So remember, 619 to 638 this is, <clears throat> this is within the membrane, but 617 and 618 are in just inside of the lumen. So this is a cleavage site right here at these double arginines. And since this is a cleavage site, uh, this probably gets cleaved and then allows the PC13s to become activated and then they can start cleaving more. So adjacent to the membrane would produce, okay, it has been suggested that the insertion into the membrane occurs in the rough endoplasmic reticulum cisternae. And uh, just know this is, the rough ER is the endoplasmic reticulum that has a bunch of ribosomes on it. And uh, that PC13 is transported into the trans-Golgi network in this form and subsequently packaged into secretory vesicles. So sorting PC13 and other enzymes to the regulatory secretory pathway is an important mechanism. So you don't want the PC13s or the other pro-hormone convertases going places that they shouldn't. You want them to be put into these secretory vesicles so that they can act upon the POMCs and the other proteins that are associated with uh, peptide formation or hormonal peptide formation. 
And PC2 and CPE may also associate with lipid wraps. However, an alternative suggestion for PC13 is that the pro region associates with lipid wraps and this facilitates the sorting to the secretory pathway. So tissue specificity of PC13 and PC2 and the processing of POMC. So further confirmation of the function of PC13 and PC2 came from their tissue specificity in mouse pituitary. Um, so where PC13 and PC2 MNA were detected in the pars intermedia, but only PC13 in the anterior lobe. So here we have a distribution of the prohormone convertases. So in the intermedia, which is in the middle of the pituitary gland, or at least separates the lobes of the, of the pituitary, uh, PC13 and PC12 are both expressed there. So we would assume that, or we could reason that the POMCs would be cleaved by both PC13 and PC2 in the uh, pars intermedia. But only PC13 is in the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So we would presume that only the cleavage of PC13 is happening to POMC. And so because of that, we could very easily um, make the argument. Now, granted, this might not necessarily be what's happening. This is just sort of a rationale. Remember, PC2 causes this cleavage of ACTH. PC2 does this. But if you don't have any PC2, then this ACTH will remain full. It will remain intact. So what does this tell me? This tells me that in the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, which does not have PC2, this is going to accumulate a lot more ACTH. However, in the pars intermedia, oh, the pars intermedia, which has both PC13 and PC2, we're going to have an accumulation of more alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone and CLIP. So um, this would be a way to have a different distribution of uh, peptide hormones in the, even within the same organ, within the pituitary gland, you could have a distribution of those hormones depending on the tissue type. And the tissue type can determine that based on what pro-hormone convertases it is expressing. So there was some controversy as studies on the rapid pituitary revealed a slightly more complex picture based on the in situ hybridization um, and co colocalization. There were high levels of PC13 in the anterior pituitary, but also lower but significant levels of PC2. However, this was clarified when co-localization experiments indicated that PC2 was not present in the cells that express POMC. So this is another thing that um, is happening. So POM PC2 uh, might be expressed in small amounts in some cells. However, those cells that expressed even a little bit PC2, they didn't express POMC. So we can rationalize that the, none of the cells in the, uh, wait, was it the anterior lobe or the pars intermedia? One second. Yeah, in the anterior pituitary, Wait a second. Let me just. So both PC13 and PC2 were in the pars intermedia. So, yeah, so the pars intermedia will have more alpha, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone and the clips, whereas the anterior lobe would have more ACTH. So if I mix those up, I apologize. So, but. In mice, they reasoned that there was some, there was a little bit PC2 in the anterior lobe, but that wasn't being co-expressed in the same cells with POMC. So this would indicate that at least with the POMC peptides, um, those are not going to be turned into 
alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone and CLIP in the anterior lobe. Perhaps PC2 works on different enzymes or works on different protein peptides in the uh, anterior lobe, but it is not this. It, it theoretically would not be POMC. So, in comparison, the PARS intermedia which had much higher expression of PC2 than PC13. So, the presence of PC13 in the anterior pituitary enables the processing of POMC to ACTH, beta lipotropin, and N uh, POMC, and presumably joining peptide, although there are few studies that have focused on the molar ratios of each of these peptides. Uh, so, yeah, this is one problem is we really we haven't done a lot of experiments to know the ratios of these peptides. So um, these different pro-protein uh, PCs are creating different peptides and different rates depending on uh, different tissues. So what would be nice is if we had a, a map to, that showed the distributions of these ratios of these peptides. Anyways, the lack of readily available assays for NPOMC and joining peptide make it difficult to measure these peptides in human plasma and, and to protect if there is processing between NPOMC and joining peptide. The absence of PC2 from the anterior pituitary means that further processing of the peptides does not occur. So in comparison, the presence of PC2 in the hypothalamus and the skin causes the further cleavage of ACTH, beta-lipotropin, and n -POMC. This provides substrates for other enzymes to complete the processing to alpha-melanocyte-stimulating hormone, beta-melanocyte-stimulating hormone, and gamma-melanocyte-stimulating hormone. So, this is saying that in the hypothalamus and the skin, um, this causes the cleavage of ACTH into beta-lipotropin and NPOMC. And then these two, beta-lipotropin and NPOMC, um, can then be converted into the other, the other hormones. So think about why this would be important in, say, um, the skin. The skin probably wa uh, has a vested interest in the production of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, beta melanocyte stimulating hormone, and gamma melanocyte stimulating hormone. So we can easily reason that this might be one of the reasons why the skin produces PC2, because without PC2, we're not going to get beta lipotropin and NPOMC, and without these two, we're not going to get the melanocyte stimulating hormone. So there's probably a reason, a rationale for why the skin would have a vested interest in the production. So say, let's say it could be that light, uh, the production of light might be causing uh, either a higher expression of PC2 or it could cause a higher expression of the other enzymes that can produce these melanocyte stimulating hormones. Uh, really, I don't, I wouldn't know, but there probably is a a metabolic pathway that would allow this to happen. Anyways, PC2 is also found in the pars intermedia of the pituitary, which is present in rodents and the fetal human pituitary. So, um, so this means that processing is more extensive and the melanocortin peptides are released under the control of regulatory mechanisms, which are distinct from those in the anterior pituitary. So in fetuses and uh, feti infoites, I don't know the plural of fetus, but in the fetus and in rodents, they are producing PC2 in the pars intermedia of the pituitary. So uh, this is in contrast with the um, what's it called? Anterior, the anterior lobe, or the anterior pituitary. So, during this time,
POM C is co-expressed, or I should say, this is allowing the production of those melanocortin peptides in the PARS intermedium. Okay, so but apparently as humans age, they stop producing as much uh, PC2 in the PARS intermediate. Anyways, let's continue. Oh, and, um, when POMC was expressed with PC13 and PC2 using uh, vac vaccinia virus vectors in cells that exhibit regulated secretion, um, a very similar cleavage pattern of processing was observed to that seen in the pars intermedia of the pituitary. Um, I don't know what the Sina vaccine virus is. Uh, one second. So it's a large complex is a large complex enveloped virus belonging to the pox virus family. It has a linear double-stranded DNA genotype approximately 190 kilobase pairs in length, and this encodes approximately 250 genes. The dimensions of the virion are roughly 360, 270, and 250. The mass approximately this. So I don't know why the time... So maybe they use the pox virus as a vector to insert um, insert genes. Um, one second. About three ninety eight. So, checks to like endoprosis PC2 and PC13 accurately cleave a model prohormone in mammalian cells. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell you. So, um, however, such studies have to be viewed with caution because of the potential degradation of the cellular environment by the virus. So, I'm presuming they were inserting the, uh, they genetically engineered the virus to express uh, the PC2 gene and perhaps also the POMC gene um, in the victim cells. And then as these cells produce PC2 and POMC and PC13, they had similar cleavage patterns of processing. Um, to that in the pars intermedia. So I don't know if this was, I don't know what cells the pox vaccine was infecting, but I assume they had a cell culture. They infected that cell culture with this pox virus, and then the pox virus had the genes of POMC with, like, we don't know, I don't know which uh, PCs it had, but it had some genes, and then in the final cell, the cell could co-express all of those simultaneously, simultaneously, and uh, they had similar cleavage patterns as that seen in the pars intermedia in of the pituitary. Uh, but we need to be careful because the virus itself can cause degradation of cells, and so we don't know what is the result of the virus and what is the result of the hormones. Anyways, and because of some observed ambiguities in that glucagon was not processed from ploglucagon by PC2 using a similar method. So they tried to use this method to see if they could turn glucagon, uh, or if they could produce glucagon, and it turns out we they couldn't. Um, let's see. I think I'm going to stop here. So... Thanks for watching, and I will see you later.